Thanks to Google for supporting PBS Digital Studios. The lyrics to the patriotic song, My Country Tis of Thee, are hammered into the heads of school children from sea to shining sea. But it turns out the song, also known as America, has origins that are something of a historical mystery. The verses to the song were penned by Reverend Samuel Francis Smith in 1831, but the tune itself predates his musical reworking by almost a century. The song has also popped up around the globe as the patriotic anthems of at least six countries, according to the Library of Congress. That includes Denmark in the 17th and the anthems of Liechtenstein and Prussia. So this week I'm teaming up with my friends from 12 Tone and The Link Space to figure out how this tune without a clear origin ended up one of the most remixed patriotic songs in history. So while patriotic tunes have a history stretching back hundreds of years, the practice of state-sanctioned and recognized national anthems originates with, you guessed it, God Save the King. And although the lyrics and title shift slightly depending on whether it's a king or queen perched on the throne, the song has remained relatively consistent through the ages. After first appearing in 1744 and being performed at a number of British patriotic ceremonies, the song was first described as the country's official national anthem. And that made the Brits the first to have a uniform formally recognized national anthem in history, although plenty of patriotic odes and songs predate this event. In the 19th and 20th centuries, many countries followed suit by either elevating already popular songs to anthem status or having songs expressly penned for the purpose. But patriotic music and anthems serve a couple of different functions. The first is to express an individual country's national identity during occasions when a bit of pomp and circumstance is required. And the second is to give us amusing blooper reels of celebrities flubbing the lyrics lyrics to the national anthem at sporting events. But America, both the song and the location, evolved out of a couple of different impulses. Namely, a desire to express a cultural and national identity separate from our cousins across the pond, and a bit of cultural remixing. Oh, and there was also some funky translation stuff that got thrown into the mix. But to trace the history of how this tune kept popping up with different lyrical dubs, I'm gonna have to peel the two components, music and lyrics, like the Hugh Grant movie of the same name, apart and trace them on parallel timelines. So the tune is the true mystery. It was first printed in Thesaurus Musicus in 1744 without a clearly attributed author. There are debates about whether it's derived from 18th century military and religious hymns, an Englishman named Henry Carey in 1740, English composer John Bull, or French composer Jean-Baptiste Lully. But we do know that the tune has always been heavily associated with the political realm, from body celebrations to national pride. When it first appeared as God Save the King in 1744, it was likely in support for the Jacobites who opposed the Hanoverians. But by 1745, the lyrics were directly written in support for Hanoverian King George II. It first appeared stateside, or at that point in history, it's more accurate to say British colony side, in 1761. And during George Washington's 1789 inauguration, the lyrics to God Save the King were converted to Hail the New Nation. So when a seminary student in Massachusetts got his hands on the song in 1831, it was already carrying a huge amount of historical baggage that he may have known nothing about. Samuel Francis Smith found it in a German songbook when composer Lowell Mason asked him to translate some of the songs into English. He decided to set a Christian-themed patriotic song about America to the tune. So while the themes of a Christian god defending a country remained consistent, he replaced the figure of the monarch with the symbol of the nation and wrote a song that is often referred to as the country's unofficial national anthem today. But the tune hasn't risen to the heights of patriotic popularity without controversy. As we all know, choosing to sing, alter, or abstain from participating in patriotic songs or national anthems is also an intrinsic part of their history. For example, in 1939, African-American opera singer Marian Anderson sang My Country Tis of Thee for a crowd of an estimated 75,000 people in front of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. The moment became iconic and celebrated in American history because Anderson, an internationally renowned opera singer, sang the song during the waning years of the Great Depression and the onset of World War II. However, some of the back story of Anderson's outdoor performance stems from the fact that the Daughters of the American Revolution had denied the singer the use of Constitution Hall because of her race. But the moment of Anderson's patriotic rendition sparked a tradition of virtuosic black women singers belting out patriotic songs during times of international conflict and crisis that Professor Farrah Jasmine Griffin details in her article, When Melindy Sings, A Meditation on Black Women's Vocality. So a song that has unclear European origins ended up becoming Britain's first official national anthem. 
even though its history as a patriotic song predates the idea of a national anthem altogether. And it became a song about American patriotism, not from ripping off Britain, but because a German songbook translation gone amok. And even though this seems about as clear as my glasses when I come in from the cold, in some ways it kind of makes sense. Patriotic songs are pretty cookie cutter in terms of the sentiments they express, and by nature they are extremely local. The only time you really ever listen to the national anthems and patriotic songs of another country are if you go there, or when an athlete ascends the steps of the Olympic podium. But to get to the bottom of how the tune stayed the same, but the lyrics and translation have continued to shift, I'm gonna turn things over to my friends at 12 Tone and the Ling Space to help me out, because I'd love to know what makes this tune so musically suitable for patriotic songs? And why has this song gone through so many language translations? And what goes into translating the lyrics of a song into multiple languages and meanings? Hi, Danielle. Thanks for having me. So when it comes to why this tune seems to make such a good anthem, there's no musical smoking gun, but there's lots of little things it does that, when taken together, help make it feel so patriotic. Let's take a look. The first thing that catches my eye is just that it's using the major scale. A scale is basically the collection of notes that you're drawing from to write your piece, and the major scale is probably the most common and most consonant one in the Western musical tradition. You've heard it thousands of times, and that familiarity means that music written with it feels like it just kinda works. To see what I mean, here's the same tune, but using a very different scale. Not quite as inspiring, is it? Another thing it's got is simple, powerful harmony. Harmony is just the other notes you're playing at the same time, and if we look at God Save the Queen, we see it starts with a simple variation of one of the most common chord progressions ever. These days, it's known as the doo -wop changes because of its popularity in the doo -wop music of the 50s and 60s, but as we can see here, we've actually been using it for centuries, and again, that familiarity and simple structure make it easy to appreciate. The rest of the harmony is similarly straightforward, but to really understand why this works so well as an anthem, we have to ask what the point of an anthem is. Music can serve lots of different purposes. It can be narrative, it can be a showcase piece for a particularly talented performer, or it can be an experiment based on a cool musical idea, but anthems don't really need to do any of that. Anthems are what we might call social music. They're designed to be sung by crowds. We don't just listen to anthems, we participate in them. Everyone sings along, but, well, not everyone's a great singer. So before anything else, social music needs to be easy. That's why most national anthems have very small ranges and very simple melodies. There's one glaring exception to that, which my friend Adam Neely talks about in his video Anthem, link in the description, but for the most part, the easier a song is for an untrained singer to sing, the more likely it is to work as an anthem, and God Save the Queen has a very easy melody. How? Well, one of the most common ways to complicate a melody is with large leaps. It's hard for an untrained voice to differentiate between this and this. You'll often wind up just going for it and seeing where you land, but if a whole crowd does that together you get chaos, so the melody of God Save the Queen almost never leaps, instead just moving up and down the scale one step at a time. In fact, there's only four jumps in the entire thing, and three of them are only skipping one note each. It's not giving the audience many chances to fail. The music also guides you through its structure with a device called a motif. Motifs are small, recognizable chunks of music that we can repeat, rearrange, and reinterpret in order to create larger works. Like, take the beginning of this tune. Notice how the rhythmic pattern in the first bit just straight up repeats for the second? The notes are different, but the timings are exactly the same, which means you only have to learn it once and then just copy and paste it so you can focus on other parts of the tune. In fact, the whole thing is kind of just a giant motif. It only takes about 20 to 30 seconds to sing, so it doesn't take up much brain space. Many versions of the song have multiple verses, but they tend to just use the same melody over and over, so once you know that, all you have to do is slap some new words on it and you're good to go. Which brings us to our next question. How do you go about about slapping new words on a tune and why would you want to? Moti, can you help us out here? Sure, Corey. So when we look at why God Save the Queen has gone through so many translations, the big reason appears to be that the British Empire has included people who speak a lot of different languages. If you want all your subjects to sing the song, you have to adapt it to their languages, which means that there is a French version in Canada, a Maori version in New Zealand, and so on. But when we look at how songs get translated, there's a bigger challenge. 
translating the words themselves isn't a problem. It might be tempting to say that some words or ideas are intranslatable, but barring the subtle stuff of culture and common ground, any idea we can express in one language we can get across in a different one. But that idea will take on a different linguistic shape, longer or shorter words, or more or less of them. And that can just make the translated version not really work with the music of the song anymore. Let's say we wanted to translate God Save the Queen into Japanese. If we just take that first line, God Save Our Gracious Queen, and we translate it using the same formal anthemic language, we get O kami wo wareira ga jihibukaki jo o mamori tamae. The original line has six syllables in it, and the Japanese one has 22. That's nearly four times as many, which is really hard to fit into the rhythm of that original line. But even in languages where you can find words that more or less match the meaning and the space, you usually still have to change the ordering. It turns out that Canada has an official French version of God Save the Queen, which looks like this. Even if you don't know French, you probably can tell it matches the rhythm and rhyme of the English song a lot better than our Japanese translation did. So it can actually work as a song translation, right? Switch it back into English though and you get this. If we compare the direct French-English translation to the regular English one, they're a pretty good match, but there are some important differences. First, we lost some of the nuance and adjectives about the Queen in the French version. In French, she isn't gracious or noble, because the French words for those don't fit the song cleanly. We also get some details about how exactly God's doing the saving. And now, instead of the Queen herself being happy, she's bringing happiness to her people which is a pretty big change, and very generous of her. That shifting around of adjectives does something interesting to the meaning as well. The order we list things can adjust the way that we interpret them. Usually for English, as we move through a phrase, we progress from older to newer information. It's a way for us to highlight what we expect you to know already, to push the conversation on towards further discussion. When we're in a song, we're not really directly trying to talk with people. So the listing effect may not have the same force, but the order we present things goes a long way. So the message we give by changing the order from victorious, happy, and glorious to glorious, long, and victorious can subtly adjust what the listener takes away. The bottom line is that when we translate songs or poetry or anything where the rhythm and melody of the words matters, we can't be as precise as we maybe want for getting across the meaning of the original. Even in cases where we can do a pretty good job of approximating, we can't help but veer away in small but significant ways. But that we can do it at all is still pretty glorious. Thanks guys! So if you Originots really like this episode and this awesome collaboration, then be sure to follow Origin of Everything on Facebook and subscribe on YouTube. And how awesome are our friends at 12 Tone and The Link Space? If you want more of their great content, then be sure to subscribe to their channels on YouTube and follow them for more awesome stuff. As always, get down into the works cited for some more nerdy goodness, get after the comments section with all of your inquiries and debates, and I'll see you here next time. Thanks to Google for supporting PBS Digital Studios. Their mobile app, Science Journal, lets you take notes and measure scientific phenomena such as light, sound, and motion using your phone, tablet, or Chromebook. You can find activity ideas and additional information on their website at g.co slash sciencejournal or check out the link in the description below.